rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. College of Union of Independent School District 544 to order. Uh, clerk, can you establish a quorum for us, please? Certainly. Kirby Anderson. Here. Natalie Knudsen. Here. Melanie Cole. Present. Matthew Lemke. Here. Lisa Hermes. Present. Stephen Mickelson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So Thank you, Melanie. A second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Agenda passes. Uh, there are no resolution of acknowledgments today, so we will be moving into our reports. And our first report is from Brian uh, Scavenger, who is the audit report from I Bailey by Zoom. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Just do an audio check here. Are we good? Mm -hmm. Good. Sounds very good. Okay, you can see the video. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for having me tonight. Appreciate being uh, towards the top of the agenda, able to join the family for dinner as soon as we wrap up. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Brian Stavenger, a partner with I Bailey, uh, located normally in Fargo, but working virtually from my home in Moorhead. Uh, happy to present the audit results for fiscal year 2020 uh, to you this evening. If you are uh, familiar at all with the uh, full audit document, uh, that's not what we're going to go through tonight, which I think is a good thing. That, that is upwards of 75 pages or so. Uh, definitely a lot of very good information, uh, but it can be extremely overwhelming. Uh, the other downfall is it's typically only presenting one year's worth of information, sometimes two, uh, but you don't get a lot of trend analysis. That's what we have done uh, for this presentation. We've called it the executive summary. Pulls out information from that full audit and gives you some historical trends uh, to look at as well. As I walk you through this, I will uh, have some intentional pauses at the end of maybe not every slide, but every few slides at least uh, to provide an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if Blake has anything uh, to add on any of the slides, I uh, just want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to uh, make any comments or ask all the questions. So we'll get going here. <clears throat> But what are the audit results? Well, when you hire us, uh, when you hire any audit, audit firm, um, and in this uh, instance, I Bailey, um, you're asking us to ultimately provide you an opinion on your financial statements. Uh, we uh, provided the district a clean, unmodified audit opinion. Really means that uh, you're following all the appropriate accounting rules. Uh, everything is materially accurate uh, based on the work that we've done. It really is truly based on the work we've done. We do not look at things 100%. Uh, if we did that, we would be side by side with Blake for about 10 months out of the year. Uh, I think 10 months is maybe a little bit longer than what he would, uh, he, he would like us to be around. Um, so we're doing a lot of sampling. We're looking at more of the high risk areas where we feel uh, the risk of misstatement or, um, or anything else might exist. So a lot of sampling is done. One item to note in this year's financial statements is there was a new accounting standard. It's called GASB 84, Governmental Accounting Standards Board. They set all the rules that governments have to follow. Uh, this rule was implemented uh, this fiscal year and then actually state statute was modified to uh, adopt as well with the standard and align with the standard. The impact on that was the student activity funds or student activity accounts and scholarship funds are now reported within the general fund. Uh, historically, they were still reported within the full audit, but they were separate from the general fund. They are now accounting for in the general fund, both revenues and expenses, and then ending fund balance. And I'll try to illustrate some of that as we go through this, but it is an important change uh, this year, affected every single school district in the state of Minnesota. When we do an audit, um, most years, uh, but not all years, most years we also have to do an audit solely focused on the federal funds of the district. You can see that first bullet there. Any governmental entity, any nonprofit, really, um, we'll just focus on a governmental entity or a school district. If you receive federal awards and then you spend in excess of $750,000 in any one year, 
you are required to have a separate federal audit. In fiscal year 2020, about 1.2 million in federal awards, thus triggering uh, the need again for that federal audit. It's really, really heavy on compliance and internal controls, specifically over those federal dollars. In that audit also received an unmodified or clean opinion, which is a very good thing. So before we move on to the audit findings, just pause there. Uh, if there's any questions or added comments, and I'll grab a little drink. <laughs> Hearing none, audit findings. So uh, we, give our, we give our opinion and then we also report to you any findings that we may have. I would really, uh, up to this point, focused on financial statement or kind of that normal audit. Um, also the federal awards, that second uh, area within this slide. Uh, we also look at, as required by the state of Minnesota, legal compliance. So there's really three different areas that we're looking at throughout the audit process and potentially can lead to findings. On the financial statement side, uh, these two findings uh, have historically been at the district, very, very common, not only at this district, but many districts across the state, uh, many really smaller entities. Um, the auditors, or I really assist in the preparation of the financial statements, also proposed uh, material journal entries, really helping the district with the uh, end of year adjustments for both state aid and property taxes, which can be uh, confusing even for us at times. Uh, federal awards, no findings to report there. Under the legal compliance header, uh, lack of supporting signatures for student activity disbursements. So three findings overall to report. Uh, these two are very, very common. Student activities, those are very, very particular. I would say um, year to year, usually we have a, uh, one or two findings as it relates to student activities. These are much, much more minor. Um, and again, very particular items and processes that we have to look at, you, you're required to follow. But overall, um, a very, very good audit. I'm going to move to the next header, but pause. Um, any questions on uh, audit opinion, uh, findings, anything before we start to get into the, the fun stuff, which is the numbers? I would just like to note on the student activity findings, those were signatures that weren't gathered after we went to distance learning. So some of the uh, samples they were taking were the students were not in the building to sign off on student activities, so it ended up being the counselor and then the, the principal to do that. Um, future going forward, we're going to if we were to go to distance learning again, student activity related purchases are happening. We will get an email confirmation from the students to go with the, the full purchase. So that's that's going to be our um, uh, fix to the, to the issue. That's all I have, Ryan. Okay, cash and investments. Cash and investments for the past eight years, uh, district-wide. So this really includes all funds with the exception of a capital projects fund. Uh, those dollars are specially dedicated to some more significant capital type projects, but looking at general fund, community service, food service, debt service, an accumulation of all the cash and investments in those funds for the past eight years. You see back in 2013 and, and really the low point in 2014, you know, just 704,000 or just over a million. Good steady growth here on cash and investments, which we're gonna, we're gonna analyze that um, a, a little differently in a, in a little bit. But generally, um, you wanna see, probably not down here, you want a little bit more uh, in the bank um, you know, what's, what's the term that's used? Cash is king. Uh, cash is king, especially in challenging times like this year. It's really, really important to have some, some cash and investments in the bank, in reserves, so that you can get through challenging economic times uh, such as this. The last time it happened, was that probably uh, 10, 12 years ago, actually kind of off this slide, uh, when the state of Minnesota was going through their uh, significant budget challenges, they were withholding state aid or delaying state aid to the school districts. Um, these types of reserves and cash balances can get you through those times a lot easier than if you have the lower balances. So at the end of 2020, uh, roughly 13.4 million in cash investments. As I said, we'll analyze that a little bit differently as we continue on through this. We're gonna get into the specific general fund and focus just on that main operating fund. Before we do that, I'll just pause briefly, see if there's any questions. 
or added comments. Hearing none, we'll move into the general fund. I always like to take a quick peek at ADM served, average daily membership, you know, really a look at your student counts. Uh, it's not nearly as simple as this is how many students you have, but we're trying to simplify for tonight's meeting anyways. You can see good steady growth on the ADM served. ADM served uh, generally is what drives your revenues, not only on the, on the state side, but also on the federal side mainly on the state side, which is the, the most significant of your revenue streams in the general fund. But as that grows, uh, generally your revenues are also going to grow. Over 3,000 ADM served at the end of fiscal year 20. General fund budget to actual. So this is one of the only slides that doesn't have much color, um, but definitely want to present to you your budget in your general fund. The first column, the original budget set in what late spring uh, early summer of 2019 your original budget that was uh, approved and submitted as you go throughout the year you have the opportunity to adjust that budget based on uh, circumstances this is your final adjusted budget third column is your actual results revenues and expenses in the general fund in fiscal year 20 and then really the column that we're going to focus on is your variance between the actual and the final budget. On the revenue side, took in more revenue, about $1.3 million more than anticipated, which is a 4.1% positive variance. You know, generally speaking, when we uh, review your budget to actual, it's not like we're uh, necessarily giving our opinion on that, but really just looking at best practices. How close are you to your budget? Uh, we generally want to see you within 5%. Uh, variance either way on the positive side is, is usually a better thing meaning, meaning you're taking in more revenue than anticipated and that's what happened so really uh, happy with the results here uh, more from my professional viewpoint within five percent four percent of budget um, and a positive variance at that as you continue down on the expenditure side so dollars that are being spent out of the general fund uh, also a positive variance and what that means is actually spent less than what was budgeted in this case, uh, roughly $1.1 million less spent out of the general fund than anticipated or budgeted. Also a good positive variance, 3.4%. So when it's all said and done, you know, kind of what I call the bottom line, uh, it's not necessarily the bottom line on this slide, but the third line up from the bottom is that, that really revenue is over or under expenditures. If you were a private uh, business. This is what would be uh, titled net income or net loss. I know that's not the appropriate wording for a governmental uh, school district, but it sometimes helps people understand what that means. Overall, you have budgeted a deficit of uh, about $757,000. Because of the positive variances on both revenues and expenditures, that came in uh, significantly better than budget. Actually had 1.6, almost $1.7 million revenues over expenditures. A good positive variance overall. Took your fund balance from about 7.2 million at the beginning of the year to just under 8.9 million in fund balance at the end of fiscal year 20 in the general fund. Remember this number here, and I'll pause in just a second here for any questions, but just remember this 8.9, 8.8 million dollar fund balance end of the year. That's going to be the focus of our conversation over the next three slides. But at this point, I'll stop, uh, see if there's any added comments or questions. On the revenue side and the federal sources, is that all the federal mo money that we receive as a district for special education and Title II services and, and uh, things of that nature? This is a very small amount of money compared to the overall budget. Yeah, and I think overall, you're going to probably, the trend has been, uh, Arnold Brown, you can attest to this, but seems like the federal side of funding in general is um, is pretty much stayed stagnant or gone down a little bit for school districts um, in some cases. He was just asking uh, federal funds on the revenue side and uh, the amount. Yeah, and I, I think that's an accurate depiction. It, it really hasn't seen uh, not at all significant increases. It's been, for the most part, flat. Uh, the only thing that would see it grow would be student growth could contribute to some some overall 
just from a, a straight dollar standpoint. So if you're looking on a per student basis, no, it's not not changing much. Moving on. Okay, let's remember this fund balance here. And that's what we're going to focus our discussion on. So it is very important to have a, a positive fund balance. Uh, I know when we started working with the district, which I can't remember exactly uh, the year it was, um, but I know there were some fund balance challenges and, and really uh, they had been in deficit. Um, you've worked uh, over uh, a good amount of years to grow that fund balance, which is a positive thing in my opinion. Um, contributes to a more favorable bond rating, produces more investment income. I think more importantly, number three, uh, any unexpected expenditures or revenue shortfalls or in, in economic uncertainty or challenges in, in the uh, e economy, a positive fund balance really, really helps with that. You, know, you look back um, when that recession happened, uh, 2008, 9, 10, um, I'm mentioning again the, the state of Minnesota and the way, the way that they can plug their budget shortfall, which I hope it doesn't happen in their upcoming uh, budget cycle, but a way for them to plug that is to delay state aid payments to school districts. Uh, they typically pay you a roughly 90% of your state aid throughout the year. They withhold up to 10% um, for kind of final calculations at the end of the year, and then they give you that. Um, at times, in the past 10 years, they've, they've uh, withheld uh, up to 40% of that. So instead of withholding 10%, they're withholding 40%. That means a lot less cash for you. Um, cash, while it doesn't wholly equate to fund balance, it's very, very similar. Fund balance is not quite that simple, but generally your cash balances and your fund balances are gonna be very similar. So it's, in, it's important uh, to have um, not only a positive fund balance, but to have a goal uh, to attain. So very, very important to have fund balance. Here is your changes in fund balance in the general fund which is really your reserves at the end of the year. Uh, after everything's accounted for, this is what you have to utilize going forward. Here's the beginning of your fund balance. Uh, and it's never as simple as this is your fund balance. Actually, I'm gonna skip ahead and then I'll come back to this. Your fund balance is always broken down into categories. This is uh, one of the wonderful things that governmental accounting uh, requires. It breaks it down to all these different categories. Really, I'm gonna point out two of them to you. Uh, restricted. Restricted fund balance or uh, restricted reserves really means there's an outside party that has contributed money to you that forces you to spend it in certain areas. And if you haven't spent it by the end of the year, you have to show it as restricted. Um, you still can spend it going forward, but you have to restrict it on those certain activities or certain areas. Really, whatever's left over is considered unassigned. Unassigned is, is your true reserves, your true rainy day fund. There's even more on here, uh, but thankfully we're gonna focus on just restricted and unassigned. So I'm gonna go back. So set up the 7.2 million total at the beginning of the year, uh, roughly 6 million or almost 6.1 million was unassigned. Everything else was considered uh, essentially restricted. Here are the two new restrictions starting in fiscal year 20. These were previously not included in the general fund, student activities and scholarships. You can see some fairly significant balances, but again, they're, they're set aside as restricted uh, with about 216,000 student activities, 80,000 in scholarships. We've also got some restrictions for operating capital, long-term facilities maintenance. Uh, that is in a negative or a deficit that is allowed. Uh, the state allows you to essentially spend some of that dollars, those dollars ahead of time, knowing that um, additional revenues will come in in subsequent years. Probably more importantly is this unassigned. $7.3 million in unassigned fund balance. And then I forgot to point out, there's that total that I wanted you to remember, 8.8, 8.9. You can see what it's made up of, comprised of, uh, with the most significant one being unassigned fund balance, 7.3 million. That's a big number. Usually the question is, well, is that good? Is that bad? What does that mean? What we like to do, and, and we've got this in a couple pages, is we, uh, we turn that into a percentage of your annual budget or your percentage of your total expenditures. Uh, before we get to that, any questions uh, or comments on these fund balances? Okay. 
this is just a, a graph to show you historically where those fund balances have been broken into the different categories. You know, you look back in 2013, you're unassigned, you know, truly your reserves and your rainy day fund. 2013 and 2014, in parentheses, means that it was a negative. Um, That's not a good spot to be in. You can see the nice growth there, uh, which actually establishes reserves, provides a rainy day fund, gives you some cushion for anything unexpected. So as I mentioned, uh, we, we then turn that into a percentage of your, your total expenditures or your budget. You know, where, where should it be at? There's uh, varying degrees of recommendations. The Office of the State Auditor says, you know, really you wanna have anywhere from 35 to 50%, no less than five months of operating expenditures. I can tell you that's a very broad recommendation to governments, any type of government across the state. Cities and counties uh, generally are going to have much higher fund balance levels uh, than school districts. And so this probably isn't the best, but it's really the only one out there, at least from a state standpoint. What's more important is probably your own internal policy. Uh, back in 2011, you established a, a policy where you, your goal was to maintain a minimum unassigned fund balance no less than 8% of the annual budget. Uh, that target is about 2.7 million at the end of 2020. And so we'll see how you did compared to your policy on this next page. So this red line here indicates that 8% level. What we've done here each year for 2013 through 2020, we've taken that unassigned fund balance, that truly reserve or rainy day fund, and we've taken that as a percentage of your annual operating budget. You can see in those first two years, it was actually negative. It took you a couple of years. Back in 2016, you were able to achieve that minimum 8%. 2017, 18, and 19, pretty consistent percentage, and then had some good growth in 2020. So at the end of 2020, June 30th, 2020, in the general fund unassigned, your true reserves uh, represent 22% of your budget a good, strong, healthy, unassigned fund balance. So I'll pause there. We're going to get into some other funds, other activities. Before we move on from the general fund, I want to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions or if there's any added comments from Blake. Hearing none, we'll move on to some other funds. Uh, these other funds, well, definitely important. Uh, the general fund is the main operating fund. We want to spend more time on that. Uh, we don't want to ignore some of these other funds. For these other funds, we're just going to look at the ending fund balance. Uh, fund balance, again, being that, that end of year reserves uh, that you can utilize going forward. We don't analyze these as a percentage. Uh, it just really doesn't make a lot of sense to do it in, in the instances of these types of funds. We're just giving you the, the actual dollar amount of that fund balance. Community service fund, uh, you can see, as is the pattern with uh, a lot of the other graphs uh, in this presentation, started out pretty low and just going, uh, showing good, steady, slow growth, uh, just over $700,000 in that community service fund balance. That fund balance is broken down into three or four different restrictions, school readiness, uh, ECFE, adult basic education, and then really everything else. Uh, those are all included in here, uh, but a good, strong, healthy community service fund balance at the end of 2020. The next slide is the food service fund. This is where all your food service programming, the revenues and expenditures are accounted for. You can see this has been really, really consistent not even uh, necessarily that low at the beginning. This has been uh, one of the more consistent funds of the district, uh, just under $250,000 at the end of 2020. You'll notice a line on here, this maroon line. Uh, food service has a, a limit to it. By state statute, essentially the state is saying, we don't want you charging uh, so much money for students and, and staff and others that you're you're establishing this significant reserve. So they've capped it at essentially three months of expenditures. You can see you're nowhere near that. If you ever were to get close to that level and exceed that level, the requirement uh, is just that you uh, essentially have to have a plan to spend it. So pretty 
uh, pretty easy once you get there. Hey, how are you going to spend it? You got to submit this plan to MDE. It's more of an administrative headache than, than anything, uh, but you've got a long ways to go. Uh, good steady uh, food service fund operations from the look of this graph. And then the very last one uh, with, with really any substance is the debt service fund. So anytime you take on new debt, uh, I guess bonded debt, uh, it's paid or repaid out of the debt service fund. So then any tax levies, state and federal, uh, other sources, revenues that come in to pay the annual principal and interest, uh, that's accounted for the debt service fund. This fund, uh, we really look for consistency. So when it dipped down in 2015 and 2016, uh, we wanted to see that come back out. Uh, this should be much more on a consistent basis or growing. It really shouldn't ever go down uh, because just the timeline of when you issue debt, there's a plan to repay it. Uh, there's planned levies that will come into play. There's state aid that, that assists you. It should very much uh, look more like this. So good to see this the last four or five years um, of good steady growth in that debt service fund. So the very last, I should say the very last slide, the second to last slide, it's just another opportunity for questions and uh, also want to provide Blake any opportunities to um, add some commentary to those last three slides on those other funds. So I'll pause there uh, before we end the presentation. Comments from the board? The only comment that I had is on the food service one that's just kind of ironic is because the federal government requires us to continue to increase our rates even when we don't want to. Uh, to meet a certain threshold, which is kind of counterproductive, where MDE wants you to know how you're going to spend that after they make you basically raise your rates to do that, which is kind of ironic, I would think, in my mind. And a comment on the food service and the community, the community uh, service funds. Um, it's, it's really awesome that we have a nice balance that um, we were planning on using some of the funds to help out with from the Lincoln project side as well. So um, it, it, uh, it's still turning out really positive here. My very last one is a big thank you to everyone, uh, especially Blake and everyone else involved in the audit. We uh, were forced to complete the audit for the first time ever virtually, um, which is a challenge. Uh, on itself, um, but to, to have Blake go through that, it really is his first year of, of understanding the full operations and going through a full year. Um, that's also uh, a challenge. So happy to be able to get through that. Um, it definitely was a challenge. It was different, um, but we are all we are all better for it going forward. Uh, but a big thank you to everyone involved to to help us get through that. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to present tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Too. Just one comment on our audit that I'd like to bring up every single year because I just enjoy doing it. Not, no, I don't enjoy doing it. It's just a good reminder to the public is that on page nine of our audit, if you and I think it'll be on our website, won't do it eventually, like in a week or so. I'm not sure Mark always did that. So. Yeah. Within Whatever some time. It has to be, that's where we'll be. Okay. <laughs> But anyway, on page nine, it just talks about, and this does not, this isn't our audit, this comes from the Minnesota Department of Education, just on our actual funding and our school profile. And just so for the public, there's 495 school districts and charter schools in the state of Minnesota reporting data for 2019. Just so that you know as the public where Fergus Falls ranks, uh, the majority of our money comes from state, state funding. And uh, now remembering that 495 is the lowest, number one is the highest. We are 468th in state funding per student uh, at 544. So just to keep that, so roughly that'd be about $8,798, which the average, the average state uh, public school student gets $11,399. So we do a lot with a lot less than the state gives, the average student. And I think that uh, is, uh, credit to us but also also some things that I always say is that you know if we would get to the state average we'd have a lot more opportunities to for our students and so it's one of those things that it's 
not all things are equal in this state. And I think they've, they've had a task force talking about that. And, um, and I don't know if we'll ever see it be equal, but uh, it's just something to, and that is consistent through the whole thing for funding wise. We are uh, notoriously at the bottom. Um, just for enrollment wise though, we are 67th in enrollment um, this year for, for our size of our school district. So. 2019. So it just shows the difference, and uh, I just think that it's good for the public to know, and also it's a good thing to talk to your legislators about too. So it would be nice that even if Fergus Falls could get to, just to state average, if we could get to state average, it'd be great uh, for our district. So I don't know if anybody have any other comments, but I'd just like to get that comment on. Okay, moving on to our next reports, we have Kirby Anderson, 544 Education Foundation and Finance. Okay, nothing on finance, but on the uh, 544 education, we did meet um, Thursday last week on the 12th of November. Um, our fall and winter newsletter is in the final draft form. The addresses are all updated and finalized. So that fall winter newsletter for the foundation will go out late this month or early December. There's also a major donor newsletter that's targeted just to those particular donors that should go out also in mid-December. Um, no auto apparel this year. I think we're not doing it here either. It's just, we're going to take the year off this year because of circumstances. We have a partnership with Victor Lundin. Um, they have an end cap in their store where, where we can have uh, uh, books that are sold and contribute to our, work with our public speaking uh, curriculum. And so there's kind of a, a private partnership, private public partnership there between. Uh, between us and Victor Lundin, when I say us, the foundation. And so that's been going pretty well. Um, November 19th is Give to the Max Day, which is a, it's a, it's a day to donate to uh, various charities. So I'll just put that in your calendar. That's later this week. Um, a lot of cancellations, of course. All school reunion was going to be held this year. And that's right now on the chopping block because we're going to have it at the Big Wood and between the Big Wood and that being open anymore and the COVID thing, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, and then of course we, we lost Otter Pride Night, we also lost the breakfast that we normally serve with the 504 Foundation to the staff development at the beginning of the year. But So we're looking at the staff development uh, January 18th, maybe providing breakfast there to uh, try and at least keep up the communication uh, and, and that particular type of uh, a venue between the foundation and the staff. And I think the, the 544 Foundation is really, they're, they're looking at different ways to try to keep things positive as we go through difficult times. And so they're uh, trying to, they're, they're doing a lot of good things for our, our students and our staff and filling in a lot of the gaps that for some of those things that we really want to have, you know, one of those wants versus needs and nice to have things and, and they really fill that gap nicely. So it's a, it's a great group of people and they have uh, done super things with, uh, with the gifts to the, uh, to the classrooms, to the, to the students and also for the, the scholarships that they do. So it's a good deal all around. Any questions or comments? Melanie okay. Cole. Uh, especially at Co-op, Region 1, and activities. Well, the activities subcommittee hasn't met, so there's uh, nothing to report there. Region 1, F, um, Region 1 board continues to meet virtually, and um, nothing out of the ordinary, still talking about services to the businesses and school districts on, on this uh, west and central side of the state. Um, we reviewed the audit um, at the last meeting, and it's a fiscally sound uh, school district and um, then just reviewed all the different uh, um, segments of workload and uh, telecom equity and how um, all the matters are being processed, all, all normal stuff. Um, the Special Education Cooperative Board just uh, met last week with a reminder that they're doing the child count, uh, which is um, intensely important for federal financing, even though our board chair thinks it's a pretty small amount, which it is, 
but um, anyway, uh, so federal financing is based on an unduplicated child count for, for across the state, and that's a big job. Uh, the director noted that there will not there be a minimum amount of performance review this year, given the COVID, um, you know, uh, restraints or whatever on on doing the regular processes. So that is um, then there was just regular personnel stuff. Any questions about any of my board act, collateral board activity? Thank you, Melanie. Missy Hermes, Staff Development and Policy. All right, the Staff Development Committee met on, on November 2nd, and um, there were a lot, there was a, a long meeting, and a lot of things were discussed. One thing that was discussed is the fact that um, staff continues to really be unable to go um, far away and attend um, these uh, different trainings and such in, in person. And so this is actually a savings of a lot of money, um, but um, staff is curious whether the school board will allow them to carry over money like we did last year that wasn't spent. That'll be allowed to carry over to 2021-2022 school year. Um, but um, they also put out a um, survey to ask staff, what are you interested in? in um, learning what, what's an area that you really would like staff development in. And um, again, in, this was a very, um, in, it was a good um, survey and some of the things that staff are interested in are, again, concern over licensure requirements and that cultural competency piece that's required for renewing your license. Um, but also things like mental health and at-risk um, students. And so the, some of the things that we did approve that people are going to be attending, um, one was for counselors attending, um, 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 yes, mental health, different related um, trainings, but also one on, well, it seems like a number of educators at the Area Learning Center will be attending a training on, um, improving graduation rates and it's really great to see that staff development committee really taking it to heart the, our education goals for our district and really being mindful and purposeful about whether the trainings that they're going to are helping our um, district achieve those goals all right and then um, Oh, and then they are also talking, too, about, again, because there is a good amount of money in that fund, whether this year they would like to have um, a speaker that would be a real morale booster, a real um, person to, again, help um, educators and other people's on, all people on the staff uh, to, have, to fund a speaker or presenter that maybe would have been out of our reach at another time. Okay, and then so that's that the policy committee will be voting on some of these policies. We met at the end of October, and um, I was I was thinking this is probably the most this that policy committee has met in a year in a long time. So some of the policies that will um, that we will be revised include tobacco-free environment. I just want to say something interesting about that that uh, tobacco policy that was a suggestion from a student school board member in another school district where they have students on the school board. And so um, what this change is going to mean is that instead of just telling students, hey, vaping and smoking is bad, also an education piece on why we don't want students doing that and why it's not good for students. Um, in terms of staff development, we're going to be looking we um, discussed a policy that's just going to put our, our, the language for our school district. So we don't have site-based um, committees. We meet as a whole. And then um, student education one, um, service animals in schools, and then also curriculum and instructional levels. Those are the policies we discussed. Questions for Missy? Thank you, Missy. 
Natalie Knudsen, Wellness and Building the Ground. Sure. So Wellness met last week, um, and it was a 15 and 20 minute just kind of touch point. There hasn't been a lot of specific initiatives happening just because Jan, who leads the committee, is in over her head with um, what we're doing. So I think the valuable part of it was we discussed some opportunities and, and what could we do to help and were there different people within the school, the different schools and sites that would be willing to maybe step up and help. Um, but it was interesting and, you know, I felt like Part of the session was a little bit of a event session for a few of the staff members um, to just talk about what's been going on and their feelings. And one of the um, high school teachers just had mentioned, you know, that it, things are stressful, just trying to address the online learners um, as well as the in-person learners and just how that's been matching up. But she said, I think the hardest part has been um, giving out the amount of apps that you know, and we've we talked about that. So she just said, I've never failed this many students, and that's just been really hard because she said, I'm going to have to make it up somewhere along the way. So um, I thought that was interesting, and I, there's definitely some room. Um, but I think a big barrier is just everything is virtual right now. So if we can, if we extend out help virtually, um, will it, will it, And then um, buildings and grounds have not formally met, but if you're if you're out by Caribou or Jimmy John's and you see the Target building, you'll see there's some fun progress happening out there, and that project is still just rolling. So, um, well. any questions for Natalie? And Jan mid January opening day then is the that is still where we're, we're at. Under my uh, reports tonight, the uh, Minnesota High School League has not met. They will meet in December. Uh, Lakes Country Service Co-op is, um, I got a quick video here. Uh, the, uh, the, it's called Stop It, and I'll explain it afterwards. So I just wanted to show the video just because um, Lakes Country Service Co-op uh, wrote a grant to the uh, Department of Justice and uh, they just uh, heard back that they received an award of about um, three quarters of a million dollars to go towards uh, buying the basic licensure to, that any school district uh, that's part of the co-op can be a part of uh, having this app 
and, and using it in their schools um, starting in January. It sounds like this one that get rolled out and stuff like that. And one of the things that they talk a lot about is just the bullies and stuff like that. And back in, I guess, my day, before the internet and before smartphones and everything else, is that if somebody bullied you, it, it was in person, it was there, and then when you went home, you were finally able to get rid of it. Or as we all know, social networking and, and, and online and Twitter and everything else that takes place is that it can actually come home to you and you can't just get it get rid of it and this is just an opportunity to be able to do it that we can actually have students know that it's wrong and actually speak out about it and, and give it to our administrators and have proof about it and, and stop some of the bullying that does go on socially which I think is a uh, positive um, for all our students eventually so it's one it's one app that they have we're just offering it to you know again to school districts to use but I think when we talk about social emotional learning and, and just a culture, climate and culture, and what we're trying to do, um, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that's just, let's face it, a lot of things happen outside the walls of the school district sometimes that are not appropriate. And bullying is one of those things and harassment of our, our, our students. And if there's things that we can do to stop that, I think it's a powerful tool. So. Who's going to respond to that app? Yeah. Uh, my understanding is at this point in time, and I don't know our administration is sitting back there, but administrators would, it's set up to go to your administrators, is what it is. Are they on, then they're going to be on 24 7 or what? No, no, again, I think it's one of those things where you filter through and you see if you're going to respond to it, if it's something that you feel that you know, you're not abreast of. I think it's one of those things that's out of sight, out of mind, but when it's in your sight and you can look at it, it's one of those things that you as an adult can make a choice to either respond to it. Uh, to do a follow-up to it and to see, you know, it could be something where somebody sends something that you know it's not. And again, it's one of those things that as a school district, we are allowed to use or we can decline to use it. But I think it's just one of those things that's, it's naive to believe that bullying does not take place on social media. And I think it's a tool that, again, it's a tool. It's a tool in our tool belt and, and you know, it's something that if our administrators believe has some value to it as they roll it out and explain about it. Um, we'll take, you know, it's an easy app to download. I mean, it's just an app, so and kids can put it on and we can see how effective or ineffective it is because I think ultimately that's the goal of it. And I think, um, so it's, I just thought it was kind of an interesting, um, again, to receive the grant. They, they wrote the grant, hadn't heard anything for quite some time, and then all of a sudden <coughs> they got awarded for the grant, and uh, now they're just they're working out some of the details of, of rolling that out, but I just thought it was something to at least make you aware of, and even our administrators are aware of, and I'm sure they'll have plenty of questions to ask about it at some point in time if we, if we as a district decide to do it or not to do it. Um, but again, I think it's something that um, at least there's there's opportunities that to stop some of the stuff that does go on that does affect students at home. So, I think it'd be interesting to see that you know how much it gets used in the first year. I would hope you know a good amount where you know an administrator can see a trend. You know, one out you know instance of being mean to somebody probably isn't cause for action, but if it's a trend, you know, this one kid. Um, but I think that if, if there's any way to prevent you know any kind of bullying or which causes so much. Um, for those of us who've been bullied, and, um, why not? I mean, especially if it's no cost to the district. Is that right? Or is that? Yep. Yeah. Correct. And yeah. Um, being that it's anonymous, that's a big thing for kids too. They don't want to report their friends or their classmates, and you know the fear of being retaliated against. I think the only concern I would have is with that 100% anonymity is if you can be anonymous and, and report something, and if you decide to misuse that system and, and report somebody for something they didn't do, I mean, it's almost like they're using the anti-bullying tool to bully somebody or to, to uh, Well, it sounds like it's a screenshot them. type of deal, like that's a big thing that kids will do, they'll screenshot right. things, and right. well, it's kind of hard to fake that. And, and we'll need to have complete administrative buy-in, because to have a tool like that, if it's not fully responded 
and too right. uh, quickly and appropriately, yeah. then we consider that maybe we do more harm than good. So it's, you know, yeah. it's a lot that that, that well, kind I, of uh, review. I think that if, if you if you roll it out and if it's just too much, you know, like there's too many reports where like you know the Indian and then are just inundated with this bullying stuff. I just, I'm curious, I, I have no idea like how much of time uh, out of the day it would take if it's, I would think someone that's, if it's going to take a bunch of your time, you don't have enough time as it is, yeah, it's probably going to buy in, you know what I mean, but, but then, yeah, there's a lot of questions on like the actual functionality of it and mm -hmm. how it would mm -hmm. work, but Well, like there's the also questions on how that's going to work with our new Title IX policy because that doesn't really allow for anonymity. Um, so how does that mesh with that? Um, again, that's a policy that we were made to have from the federal government. Um, but you're right, it would be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. A lot of moving parts. Can I ask a question, Matt? When yeah. was the last time that the State High School League met? Uh, I believe it was back in October, if I remember right. If I and now they're not going to meet again until December. December. Well, their official board does not meet until December, yes, correct. Was there? This just seems like a time when they should be meeting every month. <laughs> yeah. When, yeah. when they meet, they don't uh, necessarily come out with great for them. They, don't get <laughs> just, they have their schedule, they follow through with their schedule, and that's kind of. You get their paychecks. Okay. So, oh, that is done. I, uh, do you, were you saying something about them making those fees? Oh, it was an article I read in the Tribune about, did you hear anything about them? Um, because they raised their fees, fees like 10, 10 times um, because they're mismanaged or whatever. But they, um, were going, they, they made those fees basically the same across the board, even for smaller schools, unless I'm reading that wrong. Do you know if there's, there's a way, have they made those fees any more equitable for the smaller districts that were an extra $10,000 a year is a pretty significant part of their budget, do you know, or maybe they didn't even talk about it because they didn't know. I don't know if Derek's back there, so he may just want to that, but uh, on the fees part, portion of it, I know it's based off your school size. And it's based off your school size. They're, they're making some adjustments based on school size. Mm -hmm. Um, when looking at it, and the fees did go way up, but part of that to understand is it's basically paying for state tournaments and right. the big expenses they have up front, and then when the advertising, assuming they have it, and the gain, the advertising, that money comes back to schools, mm -hmm. at least a good portion of it, um, because the most schools like ours have been kind of demanding that they restructure their how they get their income and their financial mm -hmm. system. Anyway, and so they did, and so that that's kind of why it is. It's just it's really bad timing. That, I mean, they did it because of COVID, but yeah. And the executive board did meet today too. They did meet today. Yeah. Okay. They had a meeting this morning. I, don't I haven't heard anything from it. They did meet today. I just seen the last minutes was December. So I yeah. Was December. Today. Yeah. Well, we'll see what they said. <laughs> And then the rest of the just for Lakes Country Service Co-op, just it's just standard business and stuff like that. There is, and everybody got it. There is an election of uh, candidates uh, for three positions that come up. Um, they do a rotation basis, and it's school board uh, this time through, and so school board members, or because they do kind of a city, county, and, and school board members, so have a mix of each. So, and uh, yeah, that's all I have to report. Any question? Steve Vegas, uh, legislative liaison, meet and confer, and curriculum review. Uh, meet and confer is not meta conferred. Um, I don't even know when they will meet again. Uh, I know Lori Roder has resigned as the chair. That's about the only news that came out last month, I think. But other than that, they haven't heard anything from them. Um, I'll try to be brief. I have two curriculum review meetings to cover, so I'll just try to get the highlights. Um, so on October 19th, we we met uh, world languages presented, and we heard some from Spanish and French. And um, 
what I found interesting about Spanish and French is that when I was in when I was in uh, high school, it was more just like straight memorization and memorize these phrases and be able to say these things, take a test. They they're kind of switching that up to be more useful, which is great and retainable. Uh, one of the biggest one of the uh, like the final projects is to prep is to prep for a job interview. Uh, so they give a series of questions that they have to answer as if they were going to a job interview, which I thought was kind of a cool. Um, way of doing it so it makes it much more conversational and, and you have a purpose for memorizing these, uh, these phrases and whatnot. Um, the other thing they're, they're, they're doing is that they are focusing on being a global citizen, which, um, you know, being able to immerse into other cultures and, and uh, to, to educate not just on the language but also their you know, traditions and, and festivals and things like that that happen around the world. Uh, which is which is great. It makes it more, um, I guess, it just uh, expands their knowledge to, uh, outside of rural Minnesota. Um, they're still planning on a French uh, a trip to France next June. We'll see if that happens. Um, they would actually go with Underwood and Pelican, um, but we'll see. Um, depending on what the virus does. Science met, and Jeff, uh, Superintendent Drake, touched on this uh, last meeting, um, but the science curriculum has, uh, standards have, have changed, and it's a pretty big change. They're, they've kind of moved the goalposts, so to speak, uh, especially of when a, a, a particular student will learn a certain type of science, like earth science, physical science, and whatnot, life science, and they're moving them in like what grade they have to learn this in. So there will be a, a few kids that have, you know, learned earth science in ninth grade, and now let's move into 12th or whatever grade it is now. So you're learning earth science. So they have to figure out how to navigate that. Um, super problematic. They haven't um, figured out how, you know, what kind of curriculum you get for that. Um, but yet the science standards are kind of, they're not super, it just seems like they're just not super, um, clear either. So, um, long story short, they miss Carrie, <laughs> you know, um, being able to help organize all this. But um, they're working on it, they're, they're, they're doing the best they can. Um, let's see. Um, they have people that they could hire through staff development that could explain to the science teams uh, how to implement new standards and things like that. Of course, that's not happening with COVID right now. But that might be something to spend some of the extra staff development dollars on during the world to see. Um, they, they are doing as much as they can with the circumstances. And this is a theme for all the departments that have uh, presented is, is I, I admire them. I mean, they, they um, some, sometimes like they have to teach two or three different ways with this and like distance learning uh, kids and, and in-person kids and they have to um, figure out how to make, make sure that every student learns. It's, it's a, I can't imagine having to do my job three different ways, but they are being innovative. Um, like in the science department, like in the junior high, they're not really using textbooks as much as they're using like online materials. Um, they've got some really cool um, things that they do with my note on that. Um, what was it called? Gizmos. Gizmos. Um, they're basically like one. There's there's the there's these online simulations where, uh, like one is of a digestive system of how they uh, watch a piece of food go through, turn into you know whatever, and and how it how it can go through the digestive system is kind of like an interactive um, type of deal. So some some teachers are using that. Um, Let's see, I guess some of the, the, the needs, I guess there are some teachers paying more uh, pocket um, you know, for some of their supplies, so it's something to maybe look at, appropriating some more funds at some point for that, um, just to make that more fair for them. Um, let's see, so that's about it for, the, for that need, and then we ran out of paper, so I switched to this notebook. Um, on the, the 9th of November, we met with uh, music 
department presented. Um, uh, Michelle Danielson talked about choir, and they're singing with masks on. Um, there's about you know about 498 middle school kids. Um, live performances, you don't. I mean, this was before our numbers exploded. So I mean, live performances was kind of like, oh, should we do it or not? And now it's kind of like, probably not for now. Um, we, uh, I guess we, you know, I've seen that the, the later in the meeting we did higher replacement for the Alder. Um, let's see. Yeah, like I said, they're, they're, they're trying to be innovative with, um, you know, orchestra, not as hard to keep a mask on. Band's a little harder when you have uh, basically COVID bazookas that you're playing during practice. And uh, so there's, you know, belt covers and things like that that they can use. Um, the art department uh, presented as well. And um, just kind of went through like all the grades of how they're doing um, doing art. And I won't get into a lot of specifics, but there are quite a bit of art, art um, classes that we offer anywhere from pottery to something called rare media, where they're using wood burning and, Altered books, and there's a book binding class. There's um, uh, a bunch of different painting. There's um, let's see, mixed media, which is you know, calligraphy. Um, so there's there's a wide range of art that you can do if the student is interested in art. Everybody takes the art one, and that's kind of a gateway, to, or the ceramics one, and then then that's a gateway to get into these other more advanced classes. Um, the high school and the middle school, they're taking advantage of the time in class to, for um, working on their projects, and then they kind of flipped it so the instruction is outside of class now. Um, let's see. Fifth and sixth grade doesn't get seen nearly as much. Um, a couple times a week and scatter, so they, they don't do art quite as much. They do the basics, the color wheel, shadows, they try to get the basics for art to get them ready for junior high. Uh, we don't have we don't have um, an art teacher for elementary at all. That was one of their asks that we you know, look at possibly adding an art elementary teacher, which a lot of districts have. Um, my sister is actually an art elementary teacher in Alexandria, um, but so it is common to have them. But um, right now the the classroom teachers are doing art in the classroom, and they kind of have their projects and they. You know, it's it's just part of the day, I guess. Um, kind of crammed in, really, is what they said. Uh, ALC does have some art um, as well, and they do some pretty cool. They have a, like a, a, a class where they paint a piano. They've got um, art history. They do resin door, uh, resin pour, which is like a big tile project. It's huge and heavy, and kids love it. So, anyways, they. Um, I just I appreciate the innovation that teachers are doing um, in the classroom, despite what's going on, and, and still, I mean, they, they do care about our students. That they, they do what they are trying to do their best. Um, so that's about it for the curriculum review. Um, legislatively, we had an election, um, and um, Minnesota, the House and Senate both retain the same majorities, the uh, Democrats for the House, Senate for the um, Republicans. The, the, the Democrats lost about six seats. Uh, the Republicans is still up in the air. I haven't seen the results. As of Friday, it was still, there were still a few contested races that were super close. Um, on the uh, federal level, um, Democrats uh, have the House. The Senate is actually coming down to a, uh, a runoff in Georgia for two seats in Georgia, uh, which could flip the majority of the Senate, which is a pretty big deal, especially for any education funding um, type things that uh, President Biden wants to accomplish. Um, so that is something that's important. Um, uh, on the federal they're, uh, they're still talking about a COVID relief bill. Um, again, they're waiting to see what happens in the Senate race, but that's not until end of January. So um, they're, the Republicans are, requ are uh, coming in with a $500 billion um, uh, budget for a relief bill. The Democrats are at $2 trillion, so it's a bit of a, bit of a gap there. 
Um, and they both sides want K-12 education funding. Um, they're fighting over how much to help state and local governments um, with that. Um, let's see. I mean, there's there's not uh, there's a bunch of bills being introduced and things like that. I don't like to talk about bills because they might not get passed. Um, I'd rather talk about things that actually happen. Um, the MDE submitted the uh, recommendations for um, for the legislation uh, to consider when making budgets. Uh, they want to focus on revamping the funding formula, making things more equitable um, for for smaller schools. Uh, improving staff recruitment, development, retention, and um, you know, revamping how taxes affect communities, making sure that's that's the same. Ooh. Okay, that's about all for me that I have for today. Questions for Steve? The uh, the Georgia election the runoffs uh, January fifth. January fifth. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, the end of January. Yeah. Okay. And of course, the uh, inauguration is January twentieth. So that's it. that's okay. Yeah. Maybe that's how I go. Yeah. Next month. Okay. That's right, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Steve. Moving on to our last report is Superintendent Drake. Yes, good evening. Good evening. <coughs> First of all, uh, just a thank you and acknowledgement for all the work and flexibility exhibited by our staff. Um, this COVID-19 brings uh, daily challenges, and uh, we have people working uh, into the evenings throughout the weekends, uh, trying to make adjustments to staffing allocations, uh, et cetera. We have uh, teachers that are modifying curriculum to meet the um, in-person, distance, and hybrid learning models. Uh, so there just continues to be uh, a lot that's going on. And again, my appreciation for all the work that's taking place and uh, the flexibility. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Stoltman and his staff once again for their work in preparing for the audit. Uh, this is a big job, and uh, the district can be very proud of the audit results. Uh, it's the result of a lot of uh, good work in budget planning uh, by Mr. Mastin, Mr. Stoltman, and so um, uh, it does help, uh, especially with the uncertainty at the state level given the loss of revenues uh, through this economic period due to COVID-19. What will happen to our funding formula uh, over the next biennium uh, definitely is a, a good financial place to be to have some money in reserve right now. Uh, it takes a little bit of the stress off. Uh, just a recap probably more for the benefit of the general public as anything is uh, just the trending that's going on. Uh, in Ottertail County and in particular in Fergus Falls with the COVID-19 spread. Um, we started out the year very fortunate uh, that we uh, did not have a lot of prevalence of um, COVID-19. Um, I would still say within the school there, that remains, um, I, I still think, true, uh, but we're certainly seeing uh, it rear up in, in the community itself. <coughs> We went from uh, about three weeks ago, well, two weeks ago, um, the case rates per 20 or 10,000 uh, was sitting at uh, 50. Uh, last week it was at 66. Uh, this week um, it will be predicted to be over 100, um, possibly uh, close to 120. Uh, so it's uh, increasing rapidly. Uh, as you look at the uh, growth curve of it, um, you can see that exponential growth uh, kicking in uh, with the community. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing for incident rates or positive cases within the school district, we had that very fortunate slow start. Three weeks ago, we had six positive COVID-19 cases identified. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had seven. And then last week, we had 16. Uh, so again, you can see that it's starting to tick up some. Um, how that impacts our school is uh, um, we see the effects of quarantine and um, how, that, uh, how that changes how we have to staff our classes, um, shifting us into 100% distance learning uh, with that 14-day quarantine period. Um, 
it also highlights some of the challenges out in the community in terms of testing uh, because we may have um, a person that waits a couple days to get tested then it might be four or five days before the testing results come in and so um, Jen is contact tracing and we're making announcements to people that may have been close contacts um, even though a week has transpired since the uh, exposure event. Um, moving forward, uh, we did have an opportunity to do a rapid regional response team meeting uh, today and get some input from the uh, state epidemiologists and Outer Tail Public Health and certainly uh, talked about our ongoing instructional model uh, moving forward um, at a couple different admin team meetings today. Um, on the Chromebook side, at long last, our 200 Chromebooks uh, arrived last uh, Friday. Uh, Mike Donahoe uh, in, has been uh, in the process of distributing those. Uh, they are a welcome sight. Uh, this will leave us with some uh, reserve units uh, in case uh, um, we ship learning models and we need uh, replacements, etc. Buttweilers was here to do an estimate, uh, or at least an initial walkthrough of our roof systems. I know they were on KSS for sure. Um, I don't know if they got to uh, Roosevelt that day, but I think that's on their radar at least. So we'll wait to hear back from uh, them on their assessment. Uh, MRE, MREA excuse me, uh, kicked off their virtual conference this fall uh, last night with an awards uh, program. They had their first keynote speaker uh, late this afternoon, uh, but that will be ongoing for a couple days, and then even longer you'll have access to recordings of the breakout sessions since the conference is completely virtual this year. Uh, the Strategic Planning Curriculum Group uh, finished their work, uh, and so you are in receipt of uh, what I'll call a combination kind of white paper and list of recommendations. Uh, there's a lot to think about and digest there, uh, but I do want to express my appreciation for all the hard work and contributions that the committee put into that document. Uh, update on the Lincoln School. Uh, basically, um, well, coming up in the not too distant future will be an opportunity to tour the building. Uh, it's coming up in, I want to say December 7th, but I could be having that date off by a day or two. Um, the completion date has been pushed back until uh, approximately January 20th, give or take. Um, there was some structural elements uh, that the inspector had gone over and wanted some changes made. And then because um, things are sequential in completing that building, then that pushed off a couple other pieces uh, and delayed their work. Uh, we are uh, in the process of interviewing uh, for an, an additional uh, roughly half-time position of English language uh, support. Uh, and this was made uh, possible by some additional title monies that we applied for this year. So uh, the expense will be completely uh, covered out of those additional title funds. Um, other than that, uh, we expect uh, at long last again the uh, arrival of these electrostatic uh, sprayers uh, that we've had orders since uh, I think back in August probably. Uh, those should be coming any day now. And then uh, we were a recipient of a um, of what I'm being told is several pallets of personal protective equipment. Uh, our, our school was drawn from a list of schools uh, from the same vendor we use for our Chromebook purchases. And so that equipment, we're not quite sure what's going to arrive. Uh, Mike assured me it would be good stuff. Uh, so uh, we will get several pallets of it uh, coming uh, sometime in December. When's the last time the school district got several pallets of good stuff? <laughs> <laughs> At no cost. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Any questions for Superintendent? Right? The English language support person, is it um, across a whole variety of languages, or are we seeing a need for a specific um, dialect, or just 
Oh. Yeah, the position would be um, would be designed to support uh, any student needing English language uh, okay. support there. And they're that they're that um, well versed; they can just fill in pretty much anything. A lot of it has to do more with uh, teaching them English and not necessarily being fluent in their okay. language of origin. So, okay. uh, yeah, they, they are able to come in and, and be quite helpful even though they may not speak the child's native tongue. And, and in your um, rapid response team call today, um, the epidemiologist in the district is still solid. Uh, we're still good on our... our current educational model or are we getting edging very close or um, I, I would say it would be most accurate uh, first of all they they don't give directives uh, okay. they give guidance uh, and so I probably should should be frank about that um, they they sent out an email last Friday not the state epidemiologist but our two county uh, folks that we work most closely with saying uh, given the rapid rise in COVID-19 cases, this is the time that um, we would like to see districts start seriously entertaining a shift in learning model, if you have not so far. Uh, and they suggested possibly even looking at um, that including shifting to more 100% distance. So that, uh, that was the piece. Um, <clears throat> frankly, when we spoke to them, uh, we started out talking about uh, scenarios where we might uh, move significantly towards a uh, distance learning model. Uh, and then towards the end, um, uh, I, I in particular was curious about this, but um, the ability for us or their support with us um, in the idea of maintaining face-to-face -face instruction, especially for our younger children. Um, and I would say that um, they certainly left the door open for that and their support open for that. Thank you. Any questions for Subtentric? Thank you. Okay, moving on to our general consent items. We have the minutes for the October 26th regular board meeting and the November 13th uh, school special board meeting. Uh, bills and treasury support. Yes, uh, Steve and I met with Blake before our, uh, our meeting tonight, and we reviewed all of the, uh, the bills that we paid. Um, as we went through them, we had uh, a couple of questions of Blake, which he answered very well. He also highlighted a few items. Um, we did make a partial payment on the tennis courts, um, and then it's 31000 and then we'll also have uh, uh, another partial payment when that's complete, and the target date of that now is going to be May when it warms up again. Uh, there was some uh, some platform that we bought for the for the swim team, ninety four hundred dollars about, and I think that was a, a basic a pass through from the swimming boosters. So we want to thank them for that. Um, we had an annual payment of about forty five hundred dollars to introduce interactive services there. They provide our alert system for uh, when school is delayed or called off for the day, and any other kind of alerts that we have to send out. Um, some annual payments for a couple other things. Um, we're putting up bottle filling stations around the buildings in place of the, uh, or retrofitting the, uh, the water fountains. So we did about $1,200 worth of that last month. Um, Comstock construction, we had uh, our fifth payment for the Lincoln School, that went out. Uh, we also, they also did a small job over by McKinley where they have some of the uh, sidewalks come through like that and they grind them down um, to make, uh, take care of that, those trip hazards. So they've got that taken care of. Um, we had uh, some overhead document cameras that we bought and I think Ruby's Pantry had uh, kicked in about $1,800 of that, $9,000 that we spent on those cameras. So again, some. Uh, public, private, and, and donation support there. Uh, other than that, um, $2,300, $2,400 to paint the, the, uh, the, uh, the food truck, which the uh, 544 Foundation covered. So uh, that's about it. So our, uh, our bank balance is actually went up a little bit last month. I think it was 11 million, up to about 13 and a half million. So we're sitting in pretty good shape financially right now. So uh, any questions or comments? Um, Okay, thank you, Blake. Thank you.
personality, Lane Jinky. Well, my report is a little short, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to say that. Certified staff hire, we have uh, just one uh, teacher underneath that um, header, David Stordelin, Orchestra General Music Teacher. Um, he'll be replacing Dan Allender beginning uh, January 4th. And then, um, so that's the only personnel hire that I have. And then we also have two uh, agreements here between the school district and the Special Education Paraprofessional Association and also another uh, settlement with the Purpose Falls Food Service Association. So I would recommend them all for approval. Thank you, Elaine. Can I get a motion to approve the general consent item? So, so moved. Mr. Steve, a second. second. Thank you, Missy. Any comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor of the general consent item, say aye. 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 Opposed? General consent items passed. There is no old business. Moving on to new business, we have a joint resolution with the Fergus Falls Education Association honoring our veterans. Whereas the Independent School District 544 has veterans and its employees who have served in the armed forces, and whereas the district and the Fergus Falls Education Association wish to recognize all those who have given so much for their country. Be hereby, here, be hereby resolved by the School District 544 and the Fergus Falls Education Association. Honor and appreciate all veterans for their dedicate, dedication to our country and service to others. Well, summing off of that resolution, move for its adoption. I'll offer that resolution in the first adoption. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Barry. Uh, any comments? Question. Roll call, please. Natalie Knutson. Yes. Melanie Cole. Yes. Matthew Lemke. Yes. Missy Hermes. Yes. Stephen Vegasa. Yes. Kirby Anderson. Yes. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Item number two is just the first reading of the FY20 Fergus Falls Public School Financial Audit. And there's no action on that one. And item number three is the resolution establishing the combined home places for the multiple precincts and designating hours during which the polling places will remain open for voting for school district elections not held on the day of the statewide election. Mm -hmm. Do I need to read the whole thing? Dramatic one. No, I don't think so. Basically, this is this, an annual. This we, is yeah, we have to do this annually. It's a statute, and there's going to be there be four combined polling places if indeed the in, in event we would have an election. Um, not anticipated for or type of a, a levy or a bond, I guess. But um, we do have to have that place no matter what. And just for the general public, the combined polling places would be one Fergus Falls Public Library. Uh, uh, combined polling place two is the YMC Community Room. Uh, YMC Community Room. Bowling, uh, combined polling place three would be uh, M State Community and Technical College. And combined polling place four is the Big Woody Event Center. So no changes from last year or I think years before that, other than actually the polling places have changed with the city, which has we, we yes. tweaked according to that. I'll offer that resolution and move for its adoption. Thank you, Missy. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, any comments or questions? Okay, roll call, please. Melanie Cole. Yes. Matthew Lemke. Yes. Missy Hermes. Yes. Stephen Bigasa. Yes. Kirby Anderson? Yes. Natalie Knudsen? Yes. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Item number four is the revision to the school board policies 419, tobacco free environment, 425, staff development, 516, student uh, medication, 535, service animals in schools. Uh, this is replaced current policy 815 um, and 601 curriculum and instructional goals. Um, can I get a motion to approve those rules? So Thank you, Steve. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank you, Natalie. Any comments or questions on these? I just want to make a note that a service animal is a dog or it could be a miniature horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank you for that insight. Yes. Thank you for sharing that as a We have to anticipate <laughs> miniature horses. You don't need to keep it to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks for the Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of the, of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item number five is a 2020-2021 school district calendar revision due to snow day on October 22nd. Uh, 
move student three hour early out day to June 3rd, 2021 and staff development day to June 4th, 2021. Can I get a motion to approve that change? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Melanie. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any discussion? I just had a question on June 7th. Um, that's a uh, blue tint to it. It says it's a makeup day, so that would be uh, in anticipation if we have a snow day. That would be another makeup day. Yeah, that would push the uh, staff development day to June 7th, and then the last day with students would still be in the. Okay. So that would be if we had one more. Snow day. But right now, that's <coughs> still a. Uh, the fourth is last. Yep. Okay, thank you. I have a question about snow days in general. I mean, with us being able to distance learn, do we need snow days anymore? Is that we um, we currently have uh, nothing in the master agreement um, to move to e-learning days. Okay. So there would be a, a contract. It would be a master agreement the next time we negotiate. Is that what we have to do? Yeah, along with all the other considerations that might go with it. Okay. But our um, support staff would have to also have assignments and what they would do to make up that time besides. Yeah, so we'd have about like 200 other staff to be set. more complicated than just, it is. oh, we can do distance learning now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wish it was that easy. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Item number six is the purchase of service agreement for the transportation of children and youth in foster care placement between ISD 544 and Arthur County, effective June, uh, June, January 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Uh, can I get a motion to approve that contract? Thank you, Steve. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank you, Natalie. Any questions or comments? Is this one that we are we have to renew on a regular basis? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. That concludes our regular school board meeting. Our next, uh, oh, excuse me, following this meeting, we will go into a work session to talk about capital outlay projects, uh, curriculum, uh, strategic planning reorganizational meeting on COVID-19 and service contracts. Uh, our next regular school board meeting will be Monday, December 14th, 2020 at 515, <coughs> um, either at the uh, outer uh, community room or here at the uh, media center at Kennedy Secondary School. We also will have a public meeting of the world's best workforce on Monday, December 14th during the school board meeting. Uh, there will be a public meeting of technology planning and internet safety policy on Monday, December 14, 2020, during the school board meeting. And also there will be a public meeting of the Fergus Falls Public Schools taxes payable for 2021. Uh, this will be Monday, December 14th, also at 6 p.m. Uh, again, either at the Auto Community Room here at Kennedy Secondary School or at the Media Center. Uh, with that, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, sir. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Very good.